Hello, welcome to EHAF Indonesia 2020 Goes Online. This is Institution Webinar Series. My name is Christy Johanna. I'm going to be moderating this webinar. This webinar is going to be presented by Imperial College London. Please stay tuned until the end of the webinar because we will hold a Q&A session. If you have any questions about the presentation or anything related to the countryside education, you can submit your questions in YouTube's comment section anytime throughout the presentation. And now, uh, please welcome for the representative from Imperial College of London. Please, uh, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you for joining. Um, my name is Catherine um, and I'm going to hopefully be able to share my screen in a moment. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for joining me. So yes, for this session, I'll give you an overview of Imperial, um, a bit about um, kind of us, the sort of programmes we offer, a bit about the application process and studying in London. So about us overall, um, we are quite unique in the UK, being solely focused on science, engineering, medicine and business. We do have a very wide range of programmes in those areas, which I'll talk about more um, a little bit later. Um, we're kind of a medium sized university for the UK, so around 20,000 students and about half undergraduate, half postgraduate. If you look at the rankings, you'll generally see we're pretty good at what we do. I said we're focused, we're also pretty good at what we do. So you look at the world top 10, top five, and you will see Imperial generally amongst those um, very highly ranked universities. And the rankings can be important to kind of start thinking about. Um, but a couple of ones I like to mention that I think really sort of talk about us as an institution and who we are, are is the fact that we have been voted the UK's most international university um, at, by times higher. And that's because of of our very diverse student body. So um, well over half of our students come from outside the UK um, and that's from um, over 135 different countries. We also have very diverse um, teaching staff as well. Um, and also we collaborate widely internationally as well with international partners in research and also student exchanges. We have also been voted the UK's most innovative university as well. So that's for the support we give our staff and our students in terms of kind of enterprise and entrepreneurship. And more and more students are kind of carving their own paths with their own startup companies as well. And I'll talk about more what options might be available to you as a student um, a little bit later. As we really do think that our students are incredibly bright and will be able to make a difference to the world around them and really kind of come up with novel solutions to fight um, big world problems. Speaking of which, unfortunately these days you can't go very far without thinking about COVID-19, but just to highlight how Imperial really is at the forefront of the fight against the disease. Whether that's our epidemiologists and our scientists advising government policy on how to best kind of deal with, with the pandemic, um, to being one of the UK universities developing our own vaccine. We've been involved in rapid testing, to ventilator production, to even hand sanitizer production for our chemical engineering department. So so across the university, we really are at the heart of the fight against the disease. And all this is kind of uh, supports the idea that we collaborate widely with industry as well. So you can rest assured that um, the, the education you're getting is very relevant to industry. As we pride ourselves in, in training up uh, graduates who will be able to hit the ground running in industry once they leave us. So we are um, located in the heart of London. It's a great student city um, to be in. So if you have had uh, the ability to come and visit London, you may well have walked past our doors without realising it. So we're in the, the beautiful part of South Kensington, next to the Natural History Museum, the Science Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, you have the picture here in the bottom corner of uh, Hyde Park, huge green space um, in the city, which is literally on our doorstep. Um, Obviously, London has lots of advantages in terms of kind of the social component, the cultural experience, but also thinking about your future career as well. There is no better place to really think about um, building those networks, meeting future employers than in London. And it's not just us who say London is a fantastic city. So QS has uh, voted once more um, London as the best student city. And that's for things such as um, graduate outcomes, international outlook, for example. 
this just illustrates exactly um, where we are. So kind of when you have your bearings, you've got the blue of the uh, River Thames. And if you were to do a nice kind of tourist walk past uh, St. James's Park and to Buckingham Palace um, and towards Hyde Park, I mentioned, that's where you'll find us there. That's the main um, undergraduate teaching campus. That's where a lot of the postgraduate activity happens as well. But we do have a couple of other campuses, our, our medical campuses, for example, and a little bit further out to the west um, is our new White City campus. So we've been developing brand new um, lab space, for example, that is a postgraduate research, particularly you may well be um, in, in White City quite a bit as well. So I mentioned we're specialised, but we do have a very wide range of programmes on offer um, across the STEM um, disciplines as well as business. So our Faculty of Engineering is home to a wide range of engineering uh, departments and different programmes um, from you know, ones you might expect, such as mechanical, electronic engineering, but to areas such as design engineering, bioengineering, for example, materials. So a full spectrum of engineering uh, degrees and options available. Our Faculty of Natural Sciences has the kind of programmes you, you might expect, so physics, mathematics, chemistry, a very wide range of programmes in the life sciences, um, ranging from kind of biological sciences um, and sort of uh, more on the kind of health side to things like conservation programmes. We also, for postgraduate studies, have our Centre for Environmental Policy as well. And then the Faculty of Medicine at undergraduate level has the six year um, MBBS um, full medicine programme, um, as well as a, as a newly um, designed uh, medical biosciences programme. So that, that programme was redesigned in partnership with industry just a couple of years ago to ensure we are training up um, scientists who will really lead in that field, working on real lab problems. For postgraduate studies, we have one of the largest cohorts studying medical programmes in Europe, ranging from the kind of clinical side of things to areas such as public health, for example, as well. And then our business school. So currently we don't have any full undergraduate degrees in business. However, there are some joint options um, with those science programmes I mentioned. So you could do um, chemistry and a management degree, for example. And I'll speak a bit more about how um, you might have some, some options to take classes in the business school as an undergraduate as well. But then for postgraduate studies, we have a wide range of, of master's programmes available in areas such as finance, for example, um, sort of marketing, um, programs like economic um, sort of background, for example. And we have a couple of unique programs that really kind of um, fit in well in terms of our community. So we have um, a degree in, in management that is designed specifically for those who don't have a kind of business background, but want to become leaders in their area. So it's set up for scientists um, or engineers, for example, or indeed, if you've done a, a very different degree, um, the idea is to kind of train you up and give you those skills um, to become a leader in your field. Now, I mentioned the different kind of areas we have, but what we really want to ensure is that our, our students and our academics don't kind of work in silos, that they really kind of join together to kind of tackle um, big world problems. Um, so these are our global challenge institutes that really kind of highlight um, where we think as an institution, we can really kind of make a difference uh, by bringing our scientists together with our engineers, together with our medics, together with our business leaders to tackle these areas. So they include things like the Institute of Global Health and Innovation, our Grantham Institute for Climate Change, for example, and our Institute for Security Science uh, and Technology. So we're really kind of bringing together those expertise to tackle big problems. Just to highlight as well um, that we are um, home to a number of uh, PhD um, training centres, centres for doctoral training that are kind of located across the UK. And we have uh, a number of these that really kind of specialise um, in that area and you can do a master's um, and then integrate into a PhD. So they've been kind of given funding in particular areas that um, you know, are important um, to train people up to a very high level in. And we do really pride ourselves in terms of kind of really enhancing your time with us. So um, yes, you'll be doing kind of, you know, a high quality degree, but we want to make that as versatile in kind of the learning experience and to give you, you your, lots of options to kind of, um, you know, go beyond just kind of your pure um, studies. Our, our curriculum is research led, so you are getting um, taught by academics who are leading in their areas, and this kind of feeds down to you um, in the classroom. Obviously at the moment with, with um, COVID, we've had to adapt very quickly to innovative 
um, approach to teaching, but already, for example, um, in physics, um, one of the programs has developed an app so that students can actually conduct experiments remotely. So the experiments are going on in the lab and the students are controlling it via, via an app. So we're constantly looking to kind of improve the experience and be really innovative in terms of the teaching um, we deliver. For undergraduates, this includes the fact that we've introduced um, our iExplore programme. So yes, whilst you will be studying a science or an engineering degree, this enables you to take a class outside of your department. So you could look, for example, to business um, for professional engineers and scientists. You could do another STEM-based programme, but then you could also do something like a philosophy or a language to just give you a, a more of a kind of rounded um, experience. We also um, are one of the few UK universities to offer the uh, Europe scheme, the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Programme. So you can get involved in research that is going on at Imperial or indeed in other kind of institutes in London, for example, or we have the international leg of that, the IROP scheme. So that enables you to go to one of our international partners like MIT, for example, and take part in a research um, opportunity uh, during the summer. For postgraduate students, we pride ourselves on the offering of our graduate school. So the graduate school is um, an overarching support body for postgraduate students. So every postgraduate student doing a master's or PhD is part of the graduate school and you're automatically um, offered award-winning um, professional skills training. So whether that's to kind of support you develop your research skills, presentation skills, for example. So it's just another way to ensure that you are making the most of your time um, studying with us and able to make the most of your degree. Now, I mentioned the fact that we've been voted the UK's most innovative um, university, and this a big part of this is the opportunities that we um, give to our students. So all these things I'm going to talk about are available to every single student with us, whether you're studying kind of undergraduate mathematics or postgraduate business, um, you can have, um, you know, you do have access to all these options. So, you know, traditionally, um, if you're studying an engineering degree, you may have access to some quite uh, exciting equipment, for example. But perhaps if you are doing a more ther theoretical programme, you wouldn't have um, the opportunity to use things like 3D printers, laser cutters, woodwork, metalwork machines on a maths degree, for example. But we want all our students to be able to um, make their ideas into a reality. As I said, we really do think our students are incredibly bright. So if they have that eureka moment, they think of something really exciting that they want to make into a reality, they can go along to our, our advanced hack space network now, learn how to use this kind of equipment and actually make their ideas into a reality. If they have this great product, this great kind of prototype they're really excited about, what do they do with it? How do they get it out there to the wider world? Well, now they can go along to our enterprise lab, take part in uh, mentorship schemes, uh, pitching competitions, collaborate with other students from other departments um, and really make their, uh, their idea into a viable business. Um, some of the competitions we have, so things like our We Innovate program for female only entrepreneurs and our Venture Catalyst Challenge do have sizable um, funding pots available to bid for. So the Venture Catalyst Challenge, for example, um, our, comp our student companies will uh, look to bid for um, a share of an £80,000 uh, funding pot. So there's lots of opportunities for students to kind of make their ideas into a real, real viable business and into a reality. And just to highlight really, you know, our students are incredibly driven. They are doing demanding great degrees, but it's certainly not all work and no play. So um, whilst our students do work incredibly hard, Imperial is home to over 380 different clubs and societies. So there is definitely something available for you to get involved in, whether that's uh, sport. Um, so we have you know, our swimming pool, our climbing wall, badminton courts on campus. Um, we also even have our own varsity match um, week once a year where students of all kinds of different sports from um, to football, to rugby, to, to athletics, uh, our medics compete against the rest of the university. So sports certainly something you can get involved in. Um, we have orchestras on campus. We are next to the Royal College of Music and students can use their practice rooms. Um, being a technological university, you can also get involved in things like our robotics society, our drone society, for example. But if you just want to kind of um, meet new people and sit around and kind of um, you know engage socially, 
we also have a tea drinking society to be very British. So there's lots of opportunities for you to meet new people and try new things. And this is just to kind of give you an idea of the sort of facilities we have. So I mentioned, you know, our swimming pool, our climbing wall, for example. Um, we have a um, you know, recording studio. Um, we also have our multi faith um, chaplaincy as well. And I mentioned that the music um, rooms as well as the catering outlets on campus as well. So there's lots of kind of opportunities available on campus. So now a bit about the application process. So firstly, talking to anyone interested in our undergraduate programmes. First of all, all um, applications are via UCAS. So we are only on UCAS. So all applications will come to us via that. In terms of the academic background, um, the vast majority of times we'll be looking for either A-levels or the IB, or perhaps if you're at an international school, for example, doing the French baccalaureate, we also accept that you will see that we are on the higher end of things in terms of the entry requirements. I'd also recommend that you have a look at our online prospectus as you will see the individual degree programmes as there will be a little bit of a difference between the different options. So mechanical engineering, for example, will have a slightly different entry requirement to biological sciences. But overall, we're generally on the higher end of things, but also do, of course, take note of the very specific subjects we'll be looking for in those qualifications. So most of the engineering, pro well, all the engineering programs will need some sort of maths component, perhaps physics, whereas the biological sciences would be looking at biology and probably chemistry, for example. The majority of the application is on those academic qualifications. I'll talk a bit more about the personal statement in a moment, but generally there isn't additional testing that we'll be looking at. However, of course, there's always a bit of an exception. So just to highlight that medicine would need the BMAT test. Um, mathematics would ask for the MAT test or may include STEP as a condition of an offer. And in, again, computing might actually include STEP as a condition of an offer. So the MAT and the BMAT are, are the Oxford test and STEP is the Cambridge test. So they're just additional tests, but generally it will be based on your, um, under, uh, on your school qualifications. And apart from that, the thing that you have the most control over really is the personal statement. So this is your opportunity to really kind of highlight, um, you know, why you're the best candidate um, for the programme. Um, we give that balance of, of being kind of, you know, very academically focused. That is really important to us. So absolute minimum of the 4,000 characters, and that is the limit um, of 75% being about the academic subject. Generally, we advise more towards the 80, 85%. So why do you want to do that subject? What sparked that interest? What have you done to further that interest? Um, so that could be through demonstrating that you, you really need to demonstrate um, your interest through the activities you are doing. So of course at the moment we realise that uh, in-person activities can be limited but it could be doing an online course for example, it could be listening to a podcast, reading a journal, there are lots of ways to demonstrate that you have a genuine interest in the subject um, and that you are a really strong candidate to do that at university. The smaller amount uh, in the personal statement goes to the extracurriculars. That isn't an area that is so important to us. So we are not looking for a long shopping list of kind of 100 different things you've done since the age of five. We'd rather you tell us about one or two activities, whether that's a sport or music or some other kind of cultural activity that really kind of um, is important to you. And what's more important in the statement is for you to tell us what skills those activities have given you communication skills, teamwork, leadership skills. These are all skills that could be important in an application. So do kind of think carefully about how you craft the essay. For those of you interested in postgraduate studies, um, the application is a little bit uh, different. All applications direct come directly to us via our website. So you will create an online profile through the website and submit your application um, that way. In terms of uh, the application cycle, and I should have just mentioned for the undergraduates, we stick to the UCAS deadline of the 15th of January uh, for all programmes to start with us and in the uh, September, October. Um, for postgraduates, the applications open in October for the following uh, sort of September, October, so the end of October normally. 
um, for master's programmes, um, I'll talk about first. Um, whilst that application system is open uh, normally until around kind of June, July time, we do really encourage you to think about submitting your application earlier rather than later. And that is because we give offers out on a rolling basis. So if you're applying now for um, starting in September 2021, um, you'd be applying to pretty much all the places available on that programme. If you leave your application until, say, May, June time, there may only be one or two places or even the programme may have closed by then. So we do certainly encourage an earlier application. In terms of what we are looking for, it is, is again predominantly on your academic background. So we'll be looking back at your um, undergraduate um, GPA, basically, your undergraduate scores. So in terms of what we're actually looking for, it will vary depending on which university you have studied at or are studying at and which degree you're actually applying to. So we'll, the GPAs we'd be looking for start from a three out of four, um, but can be up to a 3.75. So that, that does vary quite a bit. Um, but just to be aware of that when you are applying. We'll want to see your overall kind of cumulative GPA and of course looking at your transcripts it will always uh, be a positive thing if you've done particularly well in the relevant subjects as, as well. Beyond that, the personal statement, there is a, a similar personal statement in, in that regard. That's how you bring your application to life. Um, everything I said about the undergraduate side kind of applies apart from the extracurriculars. What we really want is an academically focused application, bringing your kind of academic background to life, telling us why you want to do this particular programme. So you're applying directly to us and directly to a master's programme. So why do you want to do that particular master's in terms of um, you know, your kind of future journey, your career aspirations. And again, why are you the most suitable candidate for it? So you can elaborate on what you've done for your um, undergraduate studies that's relevant, but it's also your opportunity to tell us about things like research experience, internships, work experience, those kind of things that strengthen your application. And then beyond that, um, generally what we're looking for is the is two referees um, to back up basically what you're saying. So we encourage you to kind of reach out to um, academics at your undergraduate um, university who know you well, who can comment on your ability, either from kind of, you know, uh, subject programmes or perhaps a personal tutor, for example. If you have done a very kind of relevant work experience or research experience, one of them may be from that, um, but we do need one to be from your undergraduate university in most cases. For anyone interested in a PhD, normally for us, we would require that you have a master's degree in order to apply for a PhD. Um, in terms of how you go about applying, there are kind of two different routes. You may see some departments will actually specify that they are looking for PhD candidates to apply to a very specific area. So they have funding for this research and you follow that, that process a little bit like a job application. You'll just follow what they're, they're asking for. Otherwise, what you would do is have a look at the department you're interested in, have a look at the research groups that you're most interested in, and then reach out to a potential supervisor. So having that supervisor lined up in this case is really, really important in order for your application to be successful. So you just reach out with a kind of, you know, vaguely formal email in terms of explaining who you are, why you'd be a good match with them and your academic background. And it's it's developing a conversation with them. If they say, yes, that sounds great, I, you know, be happy to take you on, then the application is what I said around the master's programme in terms of uploading your kind of transcripts, writing a personal statement and your references as well. So a bit about um, how, how much it costs. In terms of tuition fees, you will see there is a, a variety on the different degree programmes. So uh, do have a look at the online prospectus for the individual cost by degree, because that will um, vary slightly. But in most cases, um, you're looking at between kind of £25,000 um, up to kind of 35 and more, depending on um, which programmes, programmes like medicine and the MBA will be more expensive than that. In terms of overall kind of costs, this is um, a rough kind of breakdown of the kind of costs you could expect um, living in London. Obviously, some people spend more, some people spend less. Um, just to highlight, as a student, you do get a discount on things like your transport around the city, your transport um, in other parts of the UK, discounts in shops, cinemas, restaurants, things like that. So it is possible to kind of be savvy and, and you know, kind of um, look after your money. But of course, you need to be prepared that there will be some expenses. 
With regards to scholarships, um, you'll find that the undergraduate uh, ones um, generally are fairly small, though to certainly look into the World Scientific Scholarships are worth a look. For postgraduates, um, we are very happy to be part of the Great um, Scholarships campaign, so we do have those available for £10,000. We do have a number of PhD scholarships as well, and these are uh, very um, sort of generous in terms of covering uh, tuition fees and stipend as well. And there may well be some um, other degrees departmental scholarships. So certainly kind of look at your options. I'd also recommend for any postgraduate students to have a look at something called the Alternative Guide to Postgraduate Funding, which is an external database, which you can see information on our website about, who give you hints and tips about how you can go about looking at funding that may be available specifically to you through your networks and how you'd put that application together. In terms of accommodation, just to say for first years, we do guarantee um, housing for undergraduate first years um, in our halls of residence. Some of these are, are right next to campus, some are a little bit um, further away. Um, you don't have to stay with us, but many students do tend to do that for their first year as that kind of settles into university life. After the first year, um, we support our students in looking for housing and this is, applies then for graduate students as well. We do have some graduate um, only halls of residence um, through an external company called GradPad, um, but many students will actually look at private housing um, after that. So our Imperial Home Solutions um, site is a, is a really great resource for that. So um, for example, landlords will be advertising vacancies that will have been vetted um, so you can be confident about them. And our student hub uh, have a, a dedicated accommodation service to support you in, in looking for housing um, as well. Obviously the benefit of London is that it is a big student city. Um, so there are a number of uh, private providers if you want to have that dorm environment where you may be staying with students from other universities as well. So London definitely has um, you know, a range of options available. So I mentioned the student hub, but just to mention a, a few of the other kind of support um, areas for you. So as an undergraduate student, you'll be given a personal tutor. So they are there to kind of really support you in ensuring that you are um, able to make the most of your time and able to kind of make the right choices in your degree. As a master's student, you have your um, course director and as, as a PhD student, you have your supervisor. But then external to the department, there's our independent advice center, our student, our student union run, our counseling services, um, and also, of course, at the moment, you know, concerns around kind of access to healthcare. So just to say, as an international student, you will have to pay as part of your visa process, the NHS surcharge. But this means you have uh, complete access to healthcare once you arrive. So you don't need to look at kind of having to organise expensive additional medical insurance, for example. You would have access to NHS care the same as anyone else would in the UK. So that's mm -hmm. um, a really good um, you know, availability for you. We also do have a dedicated international student support team. So they will be the ones who will sort of guide you through applying for your visa even before you arrive. And then when um, you are actually on campus, they do things like a welcome event, um, sort of they look to uh, allow international students to network more and kind of meet. They do um, sort of organise trips to historic houses and the theatre, for example. So again, it's just an additional support for you as an international student. We also have our fantastic careers service who are there um, from day one for you to reach out to. So whether that's kind of talking to them about doing an internship and a lot of our students will do an internship during their time with us um, to kind of getting involved in large employer fairs. So we have nine large fairs on campus each year and you can rest assured that employers really do kind of want our students. So they're very big popular events with employers who are very relevant to our, our students when industries are very relevant. All of this um, support, such as our online vacancy service that offers um, international vacancies as well as UK ones, um, is available for up to three years after you graduate um, as well. In terms of um, working after you graduate, just to highlight as well how the UK uh, immigration system is, is changing. So students graduating from next year will actually be able to automatically stay um, in the UK to look for work for two years after their studies for um, undergraduate and masters and three years for PhD students. Students. So that's a great opportunity to again kind of think about some work experience. 
kind of all of that support I mentioned kind of feeds into the fact that we have uh, very good um, kind of uh, rates in terms of uh, student and graduate employability and starting salaries. So as I said, you know, you can rest assured that our degrees are seen as highly valuable, um, our graduates are seen as highly employable. So you are putting yourself in a, in a really strong position. And our students go on to do a wide range of things um, across the globe. Uh, so yes, in engineering, you know, the motor industry, for example, we have, um, you know, kind of uh, astronauts coming through kind of from um, science programs. But as I mentioned, more and more students are kind of taking that sort of uh, entrepreneurial journey and carving their own path. So for example, Dr. Fai Ong has started up his own business um, based on a hand stabilizing glove to help people with Parkinson's disease. He used the advanced uh, so the Hackspace I mentioned, as well as the Enterprise Lab to do that. So we're supporting students in carving um, their own path. And our students, as I said, join a network across the globe. And just to highlight how um, there is an additional now support platform um, to do this called Imperial Plexus that you'll have access to once you um, leave us. So it's just another way to keep connected, make new connections with fellow alumni. So for example, if you um, land in a new city and want to kind of reach out and find out who's available, you can um, uh, get connected through Plexus. Our uh, graduates are also um, putting things like vacant job vacancies online as they kind of know how hard you will have worked to graduate from Imperial as they did. So they'll want to kind of offer it to fellow um, alumni as well. Okay, so that is um, quite a bit of information um, from me. Hopefully that was useful, but just to say, keep connected um, with us moving forward. We are doing lots of online uh, information sessions, uh, webinars. We have things like a chat to our student um, scheme as well. So you can talk to our current students and of course, keep um, connected via social media um, as well. Also have the contact details for my colleague, um, Jenny, who looks after our student advising uh, in Indonesia. So do feel free to reach out to her um, directly as well. I think that's um, all from the slides now. I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's quite really rich uh, presentation and it's actually already covered a lot of questions that us in the chat room. But then we have, we will begin the Q&A session. I already collect some questions from the chat, uh, from the YouTube comment. Uh, the first question will be, uh, is it possible to do a cross program if the bachelor or undergraduate degree uh, education background is different with the master degree that apply, they apply for? Is it possible to do that? It's going to depend on the different um, degree programs. So what you'll find is quite a lot of our programs um, will be open to students who come from either a science or an engineering background. So um, you'll see clearly listed on each of the, the kind of master's requirements, um, the degree background we're looking for. But in most cases, it's a fairly wide background, but in STEM. So we are unlikely to have someone who graduated in history, for example, come and do um, a program in our um, you know, physics department. Sometimes there will be more specific. So some degrees will say you must have a physics background, for example, or a mathematical background. A few of the programs that are much more wider, uh, for example, the management program I mentioned, so that is open to basically all backgrounds and programs like our um, environmental technology program. So it's a very much an environmental policy program. So we have students who come from kind of a biological sciences background, but also social sciences and humanities because there's kind of more policy um, around that. So you will see listed by degree program, but it may not be as narrow as you might expect. Thank you for the answer. Uh, someone asked about, is there any double degree program in Imperial College London? Only a couple of the um, undergraduate ones and they're not really, so we have one double uh, one uh, joint programs, which is mathematics and computing. Um, and then we have more the kind of major minor setup with some of those science programs. So you could do sort of biological sciences with management, for example, or with a language, um, but not many. So you will just see those, those set ones. Okay, and someone asked about the PhD training centers. Can you tell us more about the PhD training centers? Yeah. 
Yeah, so they're in set areas. So it would be that if you found one in your, your set area, and the idea is that um, you would start off with a master's programme, but during that master's, you'd be given additional training so that you basically are on a path to automatically go into the PhD. So they are in a set area. So they're not available kind of across everything. So you need to see if, if that applies to the area you're interested in, but it just means there's additional support during your master's to get you all set up um, to go into the PhD automatically. Okay, um, like, of course, uh, a lot of questions about scholarship. Okay, so um, someone asked like, if I already got a funding from example, great scholarship, is it possible for the students to get another funding uh, scheme for them to study? Quite possibly. Um, it will depend on the requirements um, of the individual uh, scholarship programs you're looking at, really. So that would, to us, we're happy for you to come with as many scholarships as you can get and, you know, kind of, um, you know, fund yourself as in many ways as possible. And we have a lot of students who do that. They may have a small amount from here, a small amount from there to support, but that's going to be down to the individual, um, you know, kind of requirements that the scholarship bodies um, will say. Um, I mentioned the alternative guide to post graduate funding and that is an external database of generally smaller scholarships so a few thousand pounds here um, so that would be an option to look so say you had the the great scholarship the alternative guide to funding may give you options or thoughts around where you might then be able to find some smaller ones as well so um, yes a lot of students do come with multiple kind of funding options okay uh, thank you and then another question uh, like, like, uh, for the master program, it's already set for a one-year program, master uh, program, right? So what will happen if, uh, for a student that, like, if the master program is already, like, uh, passed more than one year? So really the master's is set up that you would only finish in that one year. So it's, it's um, a little bit different to say in the US where there's kind of a bit more flexibility around things. Um, ours is in a sort of set um, structure so that um, with a MSc programme, generally you would have two terms of teaching, so lecture based kind of learning, and then a research project at the end. And you have a deadline to kind of submit your research, a deadline to submit your papers and everything. Um, so the only way that it would continue would be for example, if you failed um, and you maybe did a reset but it's set up that it would be finishing that 12 months so it is a full kind of 12 months that you're technically a student with us but it's all set up in a way um, that you would you know finish your lectures at Christmas with one uh, group then you'd have lectures until kind of the summer term with another so it is quite set in the way it's set up okay thank you uh, another question uh, previously, you already mentioned about partnerships with industries. Uh, what kind of partnership is it like available for master students? Um, so I guess it's it's kind of a lot of it is research collaboration. So um, more kind of what our academics are getting involved in. But what that means is it feeds down into the curriculum. So um, you know, I, I mentioned, for example, the medical biosciences program. That curriculum was was kind of redesigned a couple of years ago because we found that we weren't um, our graduates maybe weren't quite so prepared to hit the ground running when they left us. So the curriculum was designed so that they were working on lab problems that industry were working on so they were very much prepared to kind of hit the ground running um, it may be that your research um, kind of projects you might do in a master's that might have the option to do um, to do some with industry or depend on the different degree programs and the different departments and how they're set up but basically you know we as a university we just um, you know have good relationships with industry and we're making sure that our curriculum is very relevant um, so that our students can hit the ground running when they leave us Okay, someone asked, is there any scholarship for transfer program from associate to bachelor? Like, is there any kind of that? No, I'm afraid not. We have fairly limited funding for undergraduate anyway, um, and we don't really take a lot of transfer students. So um, that would be quite difficult. Okay, uh, someone asked for PhD uh, application. 
like is it possible to send the research proposal to more than one professors Yes, in terms of when you're looking for that 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 supervisor, um, yes, you are very welcome to reach out to more than one. And actually, that process can take some time. Obviously, you know the the professors and the academics are busy, so they may take some time to come back to you. Um, Obviously, you know, make sure you're picking the ones that you think there is a genuine connection with in terms of your research interests and your background um, so that, you know, they are relevant to you. But yes, if there are a couple or, you know, two or three that, you know, are working in the same research group, um, then yes, um, do feel free to kind of reach out to them uh, to more than one. Um, it could be that you then get a conversation between them and it might be that actually one, um, one uh, potential supervisor may come back and say, uh, I'm not able to take you on, unfortunately, this year. However, my colleague might be able to so yes do feel free to kind of um you know approach more than one person um, and as i said give yourself time to do that okay. uh, thank you very much i think that's the uh it'll be last question sure okay. <laughs> thanks a lot oh yeah um so uh to close is there can you give us the best three words to describe imperial college um, so initiative, uh, STEM focused, uh, international. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. That is the end of our Q&A session. And just a reminder from the screen, you can still connect with, uh, the, uh, university representative through the information given. So thank you for joining our session. Thank you for watching and see you in our next session thank you very much for the representative to for the uh, presentation okay thank you thank very you much very much good evening everyone